Hello, I'm Edwin Newman. Speaking freely today is Muhammad Hassanin Haeckel. Muhammad Haeckel is the editor and chairman of the board of the Cairo newspaper Al Ahram. He has been editor since joining Al Ahram in 1957. Mr. Haeckel is without question the leading journalist in the Arab world. He's one of the best known journalists anywhere. First, because of his influence in his own country, and second, because of the degree to which he is informed. He was especially close to Egypt's late President Nasser. Mr. Haeckel has been a journalist for 30 years. He was a war correspondent in World War II and in the Arab-Israeli War of 1948. He knows the United States well. Some years ago, he wrote a book called We and the United States, in which he argued that the United States had lost influence and position in the Middle East because of its misguided policy. I might as well begin with that, Mr. Haeckel. I have to first thank you for welcoming, welcoming us here to your boardroom, al uh, Is United States policy, in your view, still misguided? Yes, I think it is misguided. Still misguided. Misguided in what particulars? Huh? You know, mm, you know, for the first, uh, you know, one would ask, first of all, what happened? Let us take it either by persons or by countries or whatever measure we can find. If we look to the last, for example, 15 years and try to see where are the people who were the uh, 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 known friends of the United States, let us count them one by one. Nur Said assassinated. King uh, Faisal assassinated. That's Iraq. Iraq, Nuri yes. And uh, yes, Nur Said in Iraq. Yeah. Uh, uh, Prince Abdullah assassinated. Uh, 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 those who are not assassinated are isolated, completely isolated. That's if you took those are the, peop the people in Sudan who ruled Sudan, a man like Abdullah Khalil, for example, those who ruled Sudan several years ago. So if you have a look at the whole scene, then you will discover that practically all those who were known as the friends of the United States, you know, either they are no more there on the scene, or if they are still there, they are completely isolated. This is one thing. And then second thing, I would, uh, if we take it by states, let us see which states, which statesman in the Arab world now can stand up and defend the United States in any position it takes. And then tell me about an Arab country which can really pursue a pro-United States openly. It's obviously, some governments would like to do it sneakily, you know, in a very uh, 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 hidden way. But uh, that shows to which uh, uh, degree, really, the influence of the United States declined. Uh, this is obviously, the reason for that is obviously no special hatred between us and the United States, the country. I think, and I remember very well, that after World War II, everybody here in this area was looking with admiration to the United States and to the American dream. And then, year by year, experience after experience, all those dreams, or all those aspirations, or all those expectations, were uh, practically betrayed. And what is left now, if you, if you look uh, at what's left of the United States influence, you'd see a, a coup engineered by the CIA here, the dealings of an oil company there. And apart from that, really, and honestly, I don't see anything, which is pathetic. I mean, we don't want that. We did not want that. We did not ask for it. Uh, at least this is how we see it. Before I, before I pursue that point, just to pick up a detail, there is one Arab country, is there not, which more or less openly pursues a pro-United States policy, does not Jordan do so? Well, that's one country I meant by isolation. Well, uh, 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 I doubt if King Hussein can stand up and defend the United States policy. I know that in his heart, you know, he feels a certain association towards the United States. But King Hussein is completely isolated to my mind. Is, do you attribute all of this to American policy on Israel, Mr. Haeckel? You know, mainly Israel, but then the whole conduct of the United States on the world scene. You know, that was, 
after World War II, a power, an emerging power, with world responsibility, on whom so many people uh, built some hopes, or many hopes as a matter of fact. Maybe most of their hopes were beyond the capabilities and maybe beyond the readiness, psychological readiness of the United States to exercise the role of world leadership. But uh, mainly, I think through the Arab-Israeli conflict, through the American bias completely to, the, to Israel, and then through the whole conduct of the United States all over the world. When, when, when the people see, for example, and if outside the area, for example, we can't say if you are in the United States, you are to this extent affected by what is happening in Vietnam. You will tell me that, well, all right, the Vietnam War is about to end. But, you know, everybody followed what you did in Vietnam. Here was the most powerful nation on earth, bombing day after day, without a stop. An underdeveloped country, poor country, people who were, you know, what they wanted was to live, a place to live independently. Yet they were bombed beyond imagination. Their soil was destroyed, agriculture destroyed, economical potential was destroyed. Who would accept that? I mean, well, all right, you can say Vietnam is far away, but it's not that far away, especially if we see small samples of what's happening in Vietnam in our area. Well, are you, are you saying that Vietnam played as large a part in creating no, the... No, no. Not as, as far as we are concerned, as far as we are concerned directly, it is the, you know, American bias towards Israel, which have no logic to my mind. And here you find... Here the contradiction, the real contradiction of the American policy is that when your interests economically and strategically all are on the Arab side, all your aid and all your help and all your blind backing is going to the other side. Nobody is asking you to switch to our side, but everybody expect a world power with the, uh, uh, like the United States really to be at least fair, to ask what are they doing? But, you know, we are, we are being told that, you know, there, here, what it reflects, really, in the last analysis, is a contradiction between local politics in the United States and strategical interests, long range, of the United States outside. And as we see it, the interests, strategical, economical, uh, uh, cultural, every, every sort of, of interest is sacrificed for the sake of the pressure groups in the United States, for the election, electioneering, for I don't know what, and, and you know, what we hear, and you know, does not, I don't want to be uh, harsh, I don't want to exceed my limits, but what you find at the last end is a power which is completely unaware of its responsibilities, which is completely ready with politicians or leaders, politicians, I wouldn't call them leaders, with politicians ready to sacrifice actual and potential and future interests of their country for votes, I don't know where, in, in New York uh, State or in Los Angeles. This is the story we have been hearing all the time. Well, uh, would you, do you think that there might be something else involved in it? Do you think that uh, the American attitude toward Israel may have been formed in the first place because of what happened in Germany and that, that that has at least as large a part in it as the political aspects. You know, uh, uh, I'm sorry, yes. but you know, I wouldn't take this for an argument yes. because I, I, I sympathize with the Jews for what they suffered in Germany. But you know, you cannot really take people from concentration camps in uh, uh, Germany and open new concentration camps in the Arab world. The Arab world who never, you know, we never felt, we never practiced anti-Semitism for one simple reason, is that we are ourselves Semitic. So it's very strange that, you know, the German people commit a crime or the Nazi regime commit a crime and then we pay for it. Strangely enough, we are obliged to pay in kind with refugee camps instead of the concentration camps with occupation of our territory, something which even the Jews never experienced in Germany. Well, the, the point you're making, I, I know, is, is one I've heard before, which is that what was essentially a European problem was solved at the expense of, uh, of the Arab nations of the Middle East. That you know, I think it's, 
<clears throat> you know, it's, it's, it's more complicated than that. Because if we look practically, uh, you know, to, to, to the creation of Israel, although obviously, as you know, we accept the Security Council resolution, which means that there is a state of Israel. Uh, but if we look at the roots of the problem, you know, the, 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 the Jews who were suffering anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe, Russia, Tsarist Russia, wanted to migrate originally to Europe, to England, to France, because that was nearer to them. Uh, you know, you can't, in the 20th century, come with a religious myth and arm that religious myth and go and make conquest on an idea or a dream or an illusion based 2,000 years ago or more than that, 25 centuries ago. But then you come with that myth, armed, and then you come and invade and, and you know, create an upheaval in an area which was pursuing its development peacefully. But anyhow, returning back to the subject, I think that the Jews, rich Jewish families in France, in England, in even Germany, those who were, they, they were annoyed all the time with the exodus of uh, Jews coming from the Soviet, from Russia and from Eastern Europe, and they were creating to them problems. If you remember even what, what pushed a family like the Rothschild family to finance the first Zionist settlements in Israel was the fact that they do not want those immigrant Jews to go to England because they are going to raise the anti-Semitic feelings in England. So instead of getting them to England where they will create problems for them, they export that contradiction to, under that dream, under that uh, 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 myth, they export it to the Middle East. And when we remember the discussions which even happened during the first Zionist Congress, Palestine was not the first uh, 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 suggestion. Uganda was suggested. Tanganyika. Tanganyika was, was suggested. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, with the, you know, the, the after all the, the, you know, it was, a myth was necessary. So, it was Palestine. So, all right. They came to Palestine, and then it was, the situation was aggravated by the Nazi rule. And then we found ourselves at the end paying the price. Well, all right. They came and we accepted the partition plan of the United Nations. But now they don't only insist of a homeland for the Jews in Palestine. No, they insist on taking all Palestine. And then more than that, not only all Palestine, but parts of uh, 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 Arab territory. If we take this, for example, concerning Egypt, you know, uh, uh, Egypt, Sinai, for example, is not a contested area. It was never contested. It's not the Alsace and Lorraine, for example. It's not the Odernist line. It's not uh, the Sodet. You know, that is the most clearly defined borders in history. It's the first nation state in history. But then, now, right now, you will find, that, for example, it's Mrs. Mayer asking President Sadat, let's make love and not make peace, not to make war. Well, all right. Let's negotiate. Well, all right. Let's negotiate. But then, Gaza is not negotiable. The Golan Heights is not negotiable. Jerusalem is not negotiable. Sharm el Sheikh is not negotiable. A strip leading from Elat to Sharm el Sheikh is not negotiable. What does this mean? So it means not only a homeland for the Jews in Palestine, it does not, not only mean the whole of Palestine, but now we are faced with, again, parts of Arab territory, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon tomorrow, Jordan now, and then after tomorrow, God knows where it's going to stop. Well, if, if uh, we started talking about United States policy, and obviously uh, what you're leading up to, Mr. Haeckel, is that the <coughs> United States should change its policy and do what it can to oblige Israel to withdraw from the territories it occupies. You know, I, I want two things. I want two things, and to my mind, they will lead to everything. One thing <coughs> is that the United States would base its policy in the Middle East according to its interest. One. Second is that the United States should pursue its policy in the Middle East as everywhere according to a certain law of justice. You cannot base a policy 
of a world power just on the bombings, on the phantoms, on the skyhawks, on the rockets, because this is short-lived. President Nixon, when he started his first term, he sent Governor Scranton here to, to, to Cairo, and he said that he sent him on a fact-finding mission. And Scranton said at that time that, you know, he thought that the United States should pursue an even-handed policy. All right, everybody welcome back. Practically, Scranton was, was buried. His report was never heard of. His mission was aborted and finished. That's all. Because he said an even-handed policy finished. Mr. Haeckel, is it conceivable that uh, a country, the United States or any other country, could pursue a policy not evidently in its own economic and strategic interests out of what might be called idealism, or if you prefer no, the word emotionalism? No, 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 no. no, 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 no. You know, I, I don't think that any country can pursue a policy without its principles expressing in a neat way its interest. And that's why what I'm asking the United States to do. The United States now, and more in the future, will be depending on Middle East oil. All right. The United States needs this area because this area is strategically located in the middle of the world. Well, the peoples of this area, they are there, they have got a long civilization, their friendship, their enmity means something. If they are weak now, they are not going to be weak tomorrow. If they are backward technologically, not advanced, all that, all this can be compensated. But one day there will be either one nation or several states in this area, powerful enough, uh, whose friendship means something. So if I take it from an economical point of view, if I take it from a strategical point of view, if I take it from a political point of view, I mean, what I want to say is that the United States, the interest of the United States is to be friendly or to have friendly relations. Nobody asks the United States to base its friendly relations to against a principle. If they think, well, all right, that they have got a moral obligation to Israel, although I question that moral obligation, yet I'm ready to accept it. But what is the limit of that moral obligation? Does the limit of that moral obligation have an end or it does not have an end? I mean, are you going to back the existence of Israel and the security of Israel or the conquests of Israel? What you are doing now is that you are not only protecting the conquest of Israel, the conquest of Israel, but you are encouraging Israel to expand more and more. And then what's going, this is going to lead to? Mr. Haeckel, if I understand correctly, the plain implication of what you're saying is that the outlook in the Middle East for peace is very, very poor. Very dim. Very dim. Very dim. And that's, uh, 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 with the compliments of the United States, I don't want to be unfair, but you know, really, why should Israel make peace? You know, uh, 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 if we take what President Nixon gave, you know, one of the leaflets of the campaign, uh, uh, election campaign, proved, in the, with figures, that the military aid which the Nixon administration gave to Israel in the last few years, last four years, is seven times the size of military aid it took from all the administrations which were elected in the United States from 1948 till 1968, which is very strange. That, and that happens when Israel is occupying Arab territory, when Israel is defying the United Nations, practically the whole of the world society, whatever, not, what not. Mr. Haeckel, what, uh, you've set out what you think the United States is up to in the Middle East and why you think it is wrong to be doing what it's doing. What is the Soviet Union doing in the Middle East, and particularly in Egypt? Well, all right. Um, uh, uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking frankly and I'm talking fairly. Uh, the Soviet Union obviously saw that there is a nationalist movement growing in this area. And they saw that the future in this area is for this nationalist movement. And this is a correct analysis of history to my mind. What they tried is that they tried to be friendly to the people in that area. One can imagine that obviously as every other power they have got their own dreams, they have got their own plans, they have got their own designs. And part of those dreams, plans, and designs, we can agree with them. 
and then in others we disagree. So they were as when they were with us, for example, in Suez, they were with us when we faced so many difficulties, they were with us in economical development, they were with us with some military aid. <coughs> uh, but then we have our differences because obviously as a world power they have got their own design. So there is an area in which we can agree, there is an area in which we disagree. And when we, we agreed with them when agreement was in our interest and we disagreed when we found something to disagree with. Well, there was this, to a lot of us, somewhat mysterious occurrence when the uh, Soviet technicians and soldiers and airmen and so on were expelled from Egypt or asked to leave, whatever phrase should be used. Mm. Uh, and then it appears that they've been coming back. And that there have been reports that Egypt tried to get from other countries in Western Europe and even from the United States the assistance that the Soviet Union had been supplying, having failed which the Soviets were then, uh, be the Soviets then began to come back. Now, there is, is that there what is happened at all? Mm. The, there is, there is a, gr you know, uh, this question is, is loaded with so many things. First of all, the Soviets, <laughs> true. the Soviet experts were not expelled, but uh, uh, their mission was terminated. And, you know, that it was a decision taken by President Saleh. Uh, uh, and he can explain it better than anybody. Uh, I wrote in public, and that to this I stand, that maybe I was puzzled about the timing, maybe I was puzzled about uh, uh, the way by which they went out, uh, but anyhow, they went out. They came for a certain mission, and from the point of view of President Sadat, the whole atmosphere of detente made that mission uh, exhaust itself. Second, about what you said, is that we did not go for to the United States for help or to any other people for help, and then we failed. I think it would be quite naive if we went to the United States, it would be very strange, really, if the United States was giving, is giving Israel phantoms and giving us phantoms. So any of us who would think of going to the United States would be just crazy, because if, 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 there is no logic in that. So we did not go to the United States. I'll just say, if I may parenthetically, uh, I'll remind you of India and Pakistan, but that's perhaps uh, another matter. No, but n no, 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 that mm. was a shift, that was a difference. Still, they, they fought both of them with, uh, with the United States weapons. So far, Not so. exactly. I don't think the Indians fought with the United States weapons. Uh, Not exactly. No. They no. had some. Perhaps they didn't use them. You know, there's some, some old British things. But, but, but I think they fought with Russian arms, and the uh, Pakistani fought with some uh, Soviet arms, with the, some uh, American arms, added to it some Soviet arms given to them by the Chinese. But that's a different well, setup. Perhaps it's a yes. side issue. But I assure you that we did not go to the United States for, for, for any help concerning arms or military assistance, things for which we deal with the Russians. And then Western Europe, I don't think anything happened in Western Europe. You know, the, the Western, uh, France, for example, have a deal with, with Libya and it's going on. Uh, apart from that, I don't think we ever thought or we ever dreamt or we tried, even tried, to make Western Europe compensate for what we may lose if we lost anything with the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, Europe, till now, you know, none of the uh, big states of Europe can compensate the role of a superpower, still. And all of Europe is still a political expression, it's not a political reality. Added to that, then one, something with which, you, uh, 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 you, which you mentioned about the return of to my knowledge, and I think I know more or less what's happening in Egypt, I don't think anybody returned. Uh, 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 I'm positively sure, uh, not only that I don't think, I'm positively sure that uh, uh, no Soviet expert returned, although I must confess I, for one, I don't mind some of them returning back. I, for one. This does not represent the point of view of the Egyptian government. But Concerning concrete information, to my knowledge, none returned. Uh, if you are talking about desires, I don't mind some of them returning back. And I don't see, really, that there is a violation of Egyptian independence in some of them returning back. We need technical know-how, we need uh, 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 advanced technology, and I don't see why we should, we should uh, 
you're, you're saying that none of the Russians have come yes. back. Yes. May I uh, pursue this point that you mentioned? You said that President Sadat, you, you said you would not use the word expelled, but terminated their mission because of the atmosphere of detente <coughs> in the world. Now, having terminated their mission because of the atmosphere of detente, was he disappointed in what happened? What, what contribution did he think terminating the Soviet mission would make to the detente? No, no. You know, let us remember that, you know, uh, what was the idea of bringing uh, uh, Russian experts or increasing the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Russian presence here? You know, at the first beginning, right after 1967, the balance of power, the military balance of power was to the benefit of Israel completely. That was the struggle or the conflict on its local level. But there was another level. There was a world level. There was the United States versus the USSR. So the setup we found, or we found ourselves with, was roughly two local powers which cannot make peace at the top, two superpowers which cannot make war. So as we were the balance of power at the lower level was not to our advantage. So it was the strategy of President Nasser to push the struggle, to push the conflict from its lower level to make it a little bit come nearer to affecting the upper level. That was the general line of the strategy at that time. And then, so we tried to increase the Russian pressure, uh, presence here added to that some practical considerations when the Israelis started the uh, deep raid uh, uh, bombing of our schools, our factories, our, our cities. And we found that inside, although we had a strong front which was ready for defense, yet our depth was completely naked in front of Israeli raids. President Nasser at that time, that was January 1970, went to the Soviet Union. And he asked for an advanced uh, weapon by which we can face that danger. Uh, at that time, the Soviet Union said, well, all right, we have this same trees. But our men were not ready for it. So they said, all right, send you our men, and we are going to train them for a period of between six to eight months. But then six and eight months with all those raids coming to the depth, that was a serious problem. So it was our suggestion, as a matter of fact, to have those same uh, 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 missiles come to Egypt with their Soviet crews. And the Soviet Union hesitated. You cannot imagine how. People think sometimes that the Soviet Union jumped to this uh, uh, opportunity. I was there. I happened to be there in Moscow at that time accompanying President Nasser. And I happened to attend some of the meetings, especially the final meeting. And I remember that the whole political bureau, Politburo in the Soviet Union, were not able to make a decision when we first made that request. And they asked for a postponement for the meeting. And they said they are going to reply in the afternoon. And then the Politburo went on in meetings. And then they got all the marshals of the Soviet Union to join them. And then when they invited us to return back to the meeting room, we found the Politburo, all the members of the Politburo, and all practically about 12 marshals from the marshals of the Soviet Union, and they took the decision reluctantly. We were happy because of that, for two reasons. The practical one is that it's going to fill a gap till we get our boys trained for the use of the sentries. Two is that it's going to help also in pushing the struggle or the conflict from its lower level two states which cannot make peace, to, to affect the upper level of two superpowers who cannot make war. And that would create pressures on the crisis. Mr. Haeckel, I'd like to bring you back to this question of what President Sadat hoped to accomplish when he terminated the Soviet mission and what he did accomplish. That's what exactly I was trying to explain to you, is that, you know, after the Moscow meeting, he found that, you know, and now I'm expressing his point of view not out of direct knowledge, but as he made it known to the Central Committee, because I know I, I, I have no right to express his point of view, uh, what 
his point of view was uh, uh, that first of all he was not getting what he wanted exactly because of the atmosphere of the town and then the with the atmosphere of the town more than the atmosphere of the town with the plans for the town he felt that he is his uh, 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 position is the only position left out uh, uh, from the legacies of the Cold War. Tension between these two superpowers, which is no more tension. I mean, the, all the reasons of tension were taken away by the, all what happened before Moscow was sealed in, in Moscow. And then he found that he's, you know, there is room for confrontation between the two superpowers, which is never going to happen. So he felt that the Soviet presence this way was a burden on his maneuverability and not an asset. And that differs from the situation of 1970. So he thought that, you know, he would get a freedom of maneuverability and a freedom of action by this. Well, the Egyptian Prime Minister, Mr. Sitki, said not long ago that Egypt was ready for war and had supplied her army with everything it needed. What was the significance of that? You know, I, 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 it's very difficult for me, really, to, to explain or to elaborate on things which uh, uh, other people say. But I presume that Dr. Sitki, the Prime Minister of Egypt, is in a position to know. But uh, uh, I don't know exactly uh, uh, what he knows, but definitely he is in a better position uh, 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 with his responsibility, political responsibility, constitutional responsibility, to, to express his point of view, and he made it in a pledge in front of the parliament. So he must have uh, uh, something to, to back what he said. Mr. Haeckel, one of the uh, problems it seems to me the Arab nations face so far as public opinion in the United States goes, and public opinion in other countries as well, is the uh, fact that they tend to be represented in the public prints, let us say, on television, on the radio, by Arab guerrillas, terrorists, as, as they're generally called, people who hijack airplanes, people who shoot athletes, Israeli athletes at Munich, people who apparently send letter bombs through the mail, that kind of thing. And that that is what, as I say, what Arabs have come to represent to public opinion in the West. You know, I, I, I beg to differ, if you allow me. First of all, I don't think we ever had a good press practically all our lives. Either we are, you know, uh, uh, something from the past, or we are, we have no right, or we don't exist, or we, you know, so many ors. But the guerrillas, or the Palestinian uh, 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 fidayeen, as we call them, they only emerged on the scene several we, uh, years ago. All right, what was there before that? Were we having any justice before the hijacking, before the whatever you may say? We were not. So it's not, it's not the, the guerrillas thing. That's one thing. Let me remind you again of one thing, another thing, is that I don't know why the, the Israelis, for example, never had that press when they were using a worse technique than what the guerrillas are doing. What the guerrillas, Palestinian guerrillas are, are doing now, compared to what the Israelis did, is amateurish, quite amateurish. You're talking about what the Israelis I'm did talking, against the British? I'm talking about the Isra what the Israelis did against the British. I'm talking about today. Today, Margaret Truman, the daughter of Harry Truman, revealed in her memoirs, the, our, her, her biography of her father, that a bomb parcel was sent to him by a Zionist group early in 1948. You know, apart from what they did to the British, and then why do we call on the... There are several forms of violence. Supposedly that the Palestinians express their violence in a certain way. Don't you think that manipulating the press, uh, 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 blackmailing people, pressure groups, don't you think that this is a form of silent violence which still pursued till now, yet nobody talks about this? And then we talk about 
what the Palestinians are doing because they are trying to uh, 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 draw the world attention to the, to the agonies of a nation which is on the verge of perishing. You know, there are people who lost their homes, their land, everything. And then they feel that they are completely ignored, forgotten by the world, by the whole world. So, simply, whether right or wrong, they go out and say, if the world wants to forget and uh, have comfort to its conscience by ignoring that we are, we are here, all right, we are going to remind the world that we are here. Whether the style is good, whether it's bad, whether it's, you agree with it, whether you disagree with it, there is a certain point of view in that. You know, let us not forget that we are facing a whole nation which is, you know, found in the span of 20 years, all its territory occupied, all its territory occupied, under a legend starting 25 cent centuries ago. And then all its cities taken over, all its um, houses taken by other people, they are only left to refugee camps. And then they are forgotten complete. Now there is a, Mrs. Mayer said, there is nothing called a Palestinian nation. 20 uh, uh, years ago, 25 years ago, there was a Palestinian nation living there for 2,000 years without interruption. Yet people now openly and without, without second thoughts even, where are they? They don't exist, which is very strange. So when those people come out to express themselves, in a way which we know would shock the conscience of people who want to live comfortably and who don't want to hear about, you know, problems and, all right, what's, what's, you know, and I, I wholly agree that nobody have got the right to interrupt, for example, world communications. This is, I wholly agree with that. I understand the concern in the world and my personal concern. You know, I use planes and I don't want to be hijacked. Well, well but let's remember that the Palestinians are not the only people who are hijacking planes. Yet they are the terrorists, they are, you know, I was in, in, in Munich when, when, when that happened. I left Munich, as a matter of fact, the day before, went to Rome. And I was shocked about the reaction. When, or at what happened, I, I'm not ready to defend it. But what I'm asking for is that, what I asked for at that time is that for some people to sit down and try to ask themselves why. Why those people went and did what they did because this is important. You can't even take a normal criminal, an ordinary criminal, put him to court, sentence him to death, without a lawyer explaining to the court and to the people outside why that man was pushed to do what he did. Why was he pushed to that desperate situation in which he acted in a desperate way? Uh, but obviously, I remember one day I was going to see Senor Medici, the foreign uh, minister of, of uh, Italy. Entering to his room, I passed by the antechamber and I found a copy of the Corriere della Sera with the headline, Terrorismo Arabo. So I went to the office of the minister and said, you know, Mr. Minister, this is not Terrorismo Arabo. This generalization, you are branding a whole nation, condemning a whole nation, which should not happen this way. And yeah, obviously he was, he said, you know, the press and all that. But that was the tendency to brand all the Arabs, the Arabs, not Palestinians, not Palestinian commandos, not people who are desperate, no, no. It was taken, it was exploited with a perfect technique to mobilize the whole world against the whole, uh, all the Arabs. And then what is this going to lead to? Mr. Haeckel, one of the arguments the Israelis make in connection with this is that, of course, many of these guerrillas, terrorists, whatever, come from the refugee camps. And one of the arguments the Israelis make in connection with this is that the refugee camps have deliberately been maintained rather than uh, allowing the refugees to be absorbed into other Arab countries. And the, uh, they say further that they have taken more Jews from Arab countries than there were refugees who existed as a result of the 1948 war. Uh, you, know, uh, 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 you know, that's that goes even against the basic uh, 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 conception of Zionism. If the Zionists refuse to be assimilated in advanced societies like England, the United States, France, and all that, and they say no, no assimilation, 
even if there is assimilation, assimilation should be on the basis of dual citizenship. Yet they come to the people who were there in their country several years ago and they don't exist. The simply, it's not the matter of the uh, uh, problem of the refugees to be taken and settled somewhere else. Those people feel they have got a right in a certain land and they want to be back to it. And they refuse to be assimilated. They refuse to be resettled. If the Jews consider it a crime to be assimilated in New York, and they consider, for example, that the first loyalty of a Jew, that's the idea of Zionism. I'm not talking about the Jews generally, because there are Jews who refuse that, and they are for assimilation. And they think a Jewish, uh, a, a Jew in Britain is a British citizen. You cannot, in this time, have nationalism mixed with, with religion. So if, they, if the idea of, of Zionism is against the assimilation of Jews in advanced society in which they were living for hundreds of years, then the Palestinians who were there in their homeland, who can still see their houses from their camps as refugees, some of them, for example, in Gaza, can look and see his own house there. And yet you tell him, no, finished, you are not going to go there. Go and resettle somewhere else in the Arab world, in Sudan or in Iraq or... Even against, it, it contradicts sharply with the basic conceptions of the Zans themselves. What is to happen to these people, Mr. Haeckel? Some of them have been there for a quarter of a century. You know, I don't see that there is a, a, you know, a solution for this problem without a Palestinian state, without a Palestinian homeland. There is no solution, no other solution. You know, the Israelis can obstruct, they can delay, but I think they are playing against history. They are playing completely against history, and to my mind, they are committing a tragic uh, mistake to themselves, because one would have only to look at the balance of power in this area. And I'm not looking at the balance of power from the military point of view, because this is temporary. This can end tomorrow, can end after five years, it can change. But here you have got 100 million Arabs in this area with vast resources. They are rich. They are, they, are be, they are in the process of being educated. They can industrialize. They can acquire technological know-how. And there, on the other side, there, will, there is, till now, three million Jews. They can be five million in, say, all right, 10 years. By that time, we'll be 150 or 120 million Arabs. So, what's going to happen in 20 years? What's going to happen in 30 years? Even with all the might of the United States, I don't think they can solve this problem. They cannot, simply cannot. So, their dilemma is that they are trying to play or impose through the short term their will on the long term which is completely impossible. It's been remarked, Mr. Haeckel, that the people who live in the lands occupied by the Israelis seem quite docile about it and uh, tend to accept, for example, on the west bank of the Jordan, tend to accept the Israeli occupation, that they've been tied in to some extent to the Israeli economy, that the standard of living has gone up, and that there really is, are no very prominent signs of unhappiness uh, you know, as if... situation? No, no. I don't... First of all, the Israelis are claiming that they have done that now. Yet, each day they are claiming that, you know, a bomb exploded in Gaza, uh, somewhere, and all that. But, you know, I don't think this is right. Because history is not freezed at a certain moment. Well, all right, these Palestinians were surprised by what happened. And then they feel that they alone cannot cope with that situation and they are waiting for Arab resistance, forces of Arab resistance to gather around them and to give them backing. As if you have said, for example, that France was very happy in Vichy under the Germans, under the Nazis. Well, all right, there were several years when France was so quiet under the Nazis. But then when the forces were gathered, European forces and Allied forces were gathered, the French stood up and they started the resistance. And I think the same thing will happen. Mr. Haeckel, I said at the outset that you were very close to Colonel Nasser, President Nasser. I'm glad you corrected. 
I should say president. Uh, he is president. No? Yes. Uh, well, we sometimes used to say General de Gaulle even after he became well, right. President de Gaulle or General uh, Eisenhower. We well, well said right. that. after he left, he used to say President Eisenhower. But anyhow. Uh, in fact, I noticed there's a portrait of him here in your boardroom. Yes. What do you think he left to the Arab people? He certainly was the greatest Arab leader of the century. Yes. What, what was his legacy? What remained? To my mind, he left two things, two very important things. First of all, he left the idea of Arab unity. With, he did not create the idea of Arab unity. But he left, he, you know, he left the uh, possibility of the dream of Arab unity, that it is feasible. He proved that it is feasible. And he brought Egypt finally and irrevocably to its place within the Arab nation. This is one thing. Second thing is that I think he linked Egypt and the Arab nation together with the ideas and the uh, ideals of the modern world. You know, social justice, industrialization, you know, all that. You know, the, before Nasser, I think the Arabs were, you know, in a state of fragmentation. Now they are in a state of ferment towards unity. The process of ferment started already towards unity, which to my mind is going to be achieved. Second thing is that the Arab world, which was a, a feudal society completely, is now full-fledged going towards industrialization, redistribution of wealth, breaking all that feudal system, for, for example, in Egypt. This is not, uh, you know, and then creating the sense of independence and the desire for independence and the will to defend independence. So two things, two main things, as I said, Egypt and the Arab world together, I mean, the Arab nation, the dream and the possibility, and then the link with the modern world, instead of all that uh, uh, feudal outlook or fast look to the, looking always to fast. You use the expression Arab nation, yes. singular. Yes. Uh, can that be defined? Can it be identified, the Arab nation? Uh, well, here you have, you know, what, do, what makes a nation? What makes a nation? What makes a nation, to my mind, is a geographical entity, a unified interest, a joint security, and a long historical experience together under the necessities of geography and uh, 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 economical interest and security. That's it. If we look to the Arab world, it's the geographical entity is there. Even ethnically, it, it comes practically from the same source, mainly from the same source. Uh, it lived the same experience. It talks the same language. It lived under the same laws for thousands of years. More than that, what I doubt if you can have this in the United States, for example. If, do you know that all the textbooks, for example, in the Arab world are the same textbooks, even before Nasser, this was not Nasser's achievement. That means that if you take a boy in a certain class in Iraq at a certain day and take him and parachute him at the same class, same day in Casablanca, he would fit fit right away. Would that be true of history textbooks as well? practically everything, with the exception of socialism. Because some, some Arab countries adopt more or less a more progressive uh, uh, concept towards, you know, social development. And some other Arab countries, you know, prefer to concentrate on purely and, you know, narrow, religious, old, uh, I, I suppose that's really the reason I asked you whether there is such a thing as, a, as an Arab nation, because there do appear to be very great differences. In fact, if it doesn't sound cynical, the, the, <laughs> the main difference among Arab nations appears to be between those that have oil and those that do not. That's a class struggle. Yeah. You, know, you know, a class struggle can... There is a class struggle in the United States, you cannot deny that. There is a class struggle in England. There is a class struggle in France. You know, a class struggle you can have within the same society. 
it does not deny the country. I think it confirms the existence of, of uh, an Arab nation, because why should that trouble be between the haves and the have-nots? What do they care? If they are completely isolated, they don't have anything to do with each other. But the fact that there is a class struggle inside the Arab countries means that there is a certain bond between them all. What about uh, Colonel Gaddafi of Libya, who inevitably is attracting a good deal of attention? Uh, King Hussein accused him of being behind a recent attempt to overthrow his regime, which is not uh, a very brotherly thing to do if, if he did it. That kind of thing within the Arab nation. F no, no. First of no. all, I differ with you. Yes. I, I, I question what King Hussein said. Uh, uh, you know, all this we know. But within the context of a social struggle and political struggle in one nation, you must expect, well, you can't say, for example, even although this, the, 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 when a revolution comes within one nation, within one nation, you can't say this is unbrotherly because somebody, you know, a civil war in the United States was not a very brotherly thing, yet it happened. A civil war in, in, in France, in England, whatever you want, social ferment, adjustment for the future. You, we cannot, if we talk about brother, brotherly things, then we are going to return again to the logic of the tribe and freeze the whole social uh, uh, struggle. Mr. Haeckel, I'd like to change the subject Please. rather radically. Uh, we don't have very much time left. We're here in your boardroom, and the board table is enormous. And as I understand it, when you have board meetings, there are the labor unions yes. on the newspaper sit in. What, what part do they play? Are they do they have membership on the board? First of all, this newspaper is a cooperative, uh, it's cooperative ownership. And all the members of the board are elected. You know, we own this newspaper. Nobody owns it. I mean, the people who work in this, every member of this board is elected. So, by the employees? By the employees here, who constitute the general assembly of the newspaper. And then the labor union, we don't feel by this way that we have got a contradiction between uh, capital and labor. Because uh, 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 I'm not a capitalist. I don't own anything in the newspaper apart from the seven shares I am allowed by the law of the cooperative, which amounts to 700 pounds. And I have got here, we have got 3,000 people at least, owning the same shares like me. And they elect me, they elect the other members of the board. So I don't feel that we are capitalists versus labor. So when we have major decisions concerning the newspaper, and we discuss it, although more of us are, are elected from either the employees, editors, or the workers, we prefer also to have the uh, union, labor union with us, so that they would be in the know of what we are doing exactly. What about editorial policy? How is that determined? No, the editorial policy is determined by the editor and it is discussed each year in the uh, 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 board of directors. I'm Unless there is something which violates the independence or the integrity of the newspaper and the, the uh, uh, board of directors would like to bring the uh, editor to account. What about the uh, relationship now between the press in Egypt and the government? You, you said earlier that you were with Colonel Nasser, President Nasser, when he was in the Soviet Union. You yes. sat in on the meetings. Mm. Uh, most of us who are reporters... No, I was not a reporter don't at don't that time. I was that. Minister of Information. Minister for of an information. interruption in my career, for several months, I was appointed Minister of Information. What is the degree of freedom that the press now enjoys? I don't ask this in any no, invidious no, way. No, what, what is no, the degree no. of freedom the press now I, enjoys I in think Egypt? I, I would be lying to myself if I said that we enjoy complete freedom. But I think that within the circumstances of a country in war, I think we are, we are doing all right. I would like to ask for more. And, but I must say that I've got a sensor downstairs seeing what is affecting uh, uh, national security, because we are in a state of war. This I accept. Sometimes I see that the censor, for example, exceeds his interpretation of what he considers national security, and I refuse to abide by his orders, or well, by his uh, the instructions which are given to him. And we come out and we say it's up to the other side to confiscate the newspaper if they want to. And they never did it once. That means that I have got a censor who is looking after national security, movements of the troops and all that. Sometimes he exceeds his limits. But we are free to reject his 
decisions, and we can go to the court. Have you any general view, Mr. Haeckel, on how, whether the national in, how well the national interest is served in a, in a country in the state of development of Egypt, which as one would say was what, a developing country, uh, by uh, a free press or by a press that is somewhat trammeled? Nothing to compensate a free press. Nothing to compensate a free press. But, you know, I must accept when the country is in war, which you accepted, which everybody accepted, which till now in England is being practiced in the denotes, even after, without the war, I must accept certain limits to my freedom, which I always try to challenge, and I always try to broaden. But, you know, there are times when you are obliged to accept things which, you are, which are basically against all what you believe in, but you feel that this is a national necessity. You regard, uh, you regard, you've used the uh, expression a country at war. You regard the Egypt then as being at war because... One seventh of Egypt is occupied. occupied. So what, what the country at war more than that? The prospect for peace then, Mr. Haeckel, we only have about a minute, a minute and a half left. Uh, the prospect for peace seems to you to be uh, pretty dim, and yet some people have interpreted some things you've written recently as uh, suggesting that uh, some kind of settlement should be sought rather than a military... I uh, wish they tell act. me what... I don't say that the military way is the only way, but I say that there is the political way with the use of military power when necessary is the way. But I would not say it's only a con you know, it's not only a military comfort confrontation. It's more than that. What I'm trying to say is that you know the confrontation which we are having with the Israelis is not only a military confrontation. It's a wider uh, front than that. The military aspects come within that. Come within within a big broad front. But uh, I don't think that I ruled out at all. And I don't think I, I will rule the possibility of the use of force. Otherwise, the Israelis... And I don't think, frankly speaking, I don't think that the Israelis are going to leave those positions occupied in our territory before they are forced to. The most important thing is to prepare the whole general political atmosphere where the exercise of military power will be most effective. Thank you very much, Mr. Haeckel. Mohammed Haeckel has been speaking freely. Edwin Newman, NBC News.